Thanks, Milad. Uh, so yeah, I've been here for about a year now. Um, I see a lot of new faces, some familiar faces, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a really great year, so I'm really happy to be, be here at CMU. Um, this isn't actually work from my PhD thesis. Some of it is. Um, this is actually not going to be a very technical talk. I intended today to kind of give a fun talk. Maybe it's the end of the semester, people are tired, and people probably don't want to listen to things that are too technical or too hard. Um, and I also kind of wanted to try to convey why I'm interested in the subject and maybe um, get some of you people interested in it too because I think it's, it's a, an interesting topic, degrees of freedom. And uh, oh, one more thing. Throughout the talk, I'm going to be giving a bunch of kind of quiz questions um, to try to make it more fun. Uh, so my original idea was to have all the sandwiches up here at the front and then I could kind of throw them at you if you got the right answer, but I think the organizers weren't too happy with that idea. Okay, so degrees of freedom, what does it mean? You've probably heard that word a lot of times. Um, it means different things in different fields. It's not only a, a topic in statistics and machine learning, but kind of across fields. But I think there's kind of a core concept underneath this idea, and that is that uh, it has to do with measuring the dimension or the effective number of parameters of something. So in mechanics, that something is, is a mechanical system. And in physics and chemistry, that's something as a physical system. And in statistics, that something is an estimation procedure. So there's two kind of slightly different uses of the word degrees of freedom in statistics. This is the one I'm, I'm going to focus on. So we want to kind of understand how, how many parameters an estimation procedure is fitting. That's, that's the basic idea of degrees of freedom. And um, one of the nice commonalities between these fields is that we can usually guess degrees of freedom based on intuition. It's usually something where we can kind of look at it and say, oh, I think it's going to be this, and then we might work out the math, and it turns out to be true. So I'm going to kind of go through, I thought it might be fun just to go through the first two fields and show you some examples of degrees of freedom, because there's some relationship, very kind of loose, high-level relationship between degrees of freedom in mechanics and in physics and chemistry with that in statistics. So what is it in mechanics? So... Uh, Degrees of freedom is defined as the number of parameters in this field needed to describe the configuration of some mechanical system. You can also think about it as the number of ways in which uh, some kind of mechanical body is free to move. So people who work on robotics may be much more familiar with this than I am. So if I say something wrong, you can interrupt me and tell me what I said wrong. But uh, okay, here's some examples. A train on a train track had only has one degree of freedom, right? Because all it can do is move forwards and backwards on that track. Or if I want to specify its position, I could just define some origin, and then I can tell you how far along the track it is, that would tell me where the train is. A bumper car, so we all probably did bumper cars when we were kids, they actually have three degrees of freedom. Right, because it can move anywhere in that 2D plane, which is the floor, it can't move up or down. It can also spin around the axis defined by the pole. Right, so once I know those, it's x, y position, and it's angle, it tells me where the car is. Okay, so here's one of my first quiz questions. You can just shout out the answer. How many degrees of freedom does a boat have on the water? What do you guys think? It's a rigid boat on an open body of water. Four? Four? Three. Three? Okay, so the answer is actually six. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. So, uh, you can move forwards or backwards. I guess if you're a sailor, that's called surging. Um, swaying is called moving left or right. Heaving is called moving up or down. And there's also three kind of tilts that you can apply to the boat. There's rolling, which is moving, uh, I guess it's rolling side to side. There's pitching, which is rolling forward and backwards. And then there's yawing, which is the boat kind of turning. So those are, if, if I know those six numbers, I can tell you exactly uh, where the boat is. Okay, so how about the human arm? How many degrees of freedom does the human arm have from the elbow to the fingertips? So this one, I'd be very impressed if people guess the answer. But uh, anybody who has robotics, just venture a guess. Not everyone all at once, just give me one guess. 37. 37, that's actually not that far off. 26. So I don't know why this is true, but apparently there's 26 degrees of freedom in the human arm. And uh, robot arms try to emulate human movements using the fewest degrees of freedom as possible. Because degrees of freedom are kind of expensive 
in terms of monetary value to to put into a, like a robot arm contraption, they're also they're prone to failure. So this is kind of an analogy to to this idea in statistics. Maybe this idea of simplicity is that if we have two estimation procedures, we'd like to take one that has the fewest degrees of freedom possible if it's if it's giving us the same performance, right? Because maybe something that somehow maybe relates to the variance of the procedure, or just the idea that we want to get the biggest bang for our buck. Okay, what about physics and chemistry? So uh, in this field, there's also the concept of degrees of freedom, and it's very similar. There are first the number of parameters needed to describe the state of a physical system. And again, you can think of this as a number of ways in which a physical system can freely move around. So um, another one of these quiz questions. Suppose I have this diatomic molecule. So I have two molecules that are joined by a bond. How many degrees of freedom do you think that has? How many ways um, are there in which this uh, diatomic molecule can move? Four, that's pretty close. There's actually six, and I wouldn't have guessed this myself, not being a physicist or a chemist, but. Um, so if you think about the center of mass, I can move the center of mass three directions, right? That's just anywhere in the XYZ plane. Then there's two degrees of rotation. I can rotate um, according to kind of around the molecules like this. I can also spin around the molecules like that. For some reason, people in physics and chemistry don't count rotation around the bond. The axis defined by the bond, maybe because the, the molecules are probably symmetric. Um, and then there's one vibratory degree, degree of freedom. So that's, I wouldn't have guessed that. But um, a similar concept to that in mechanics. <coughs> okay, now in statistics and in machine learning. So like I said before, um, we define it intuitively as the effective number of parameters used by an estimation procedure. And just at a high level, it's important that I'm referring to the estimation procedure itself and what it did, rather than the final output. Right, because I could think of my estimation procedure giving me some model that has a number of parameters in it, but it might not always be true that the degrees of freedom is just the number of parameters in the final <coughs> model. Depends how those were fitted. Right, so you can think of the estimation procedure as some kind of um, black box, and I want to know I want to open up the box and say, really, what, what's happening inside that box? How many parameters is it fitting and producing the model, not just in the final model itself? So it, it is true, it's, it seems kind of like a vague concept, but it actually has a pretty precise definition for a broad class of, of these estimation problems, and we're going to cover that definition shortly. Um, but first I want to just convey uh, a little bit why I think it's an important concept and why you'd ever go to the trouble of describing degrees of freedom. Because maybe sometimes it would be hard to do so. So you might wonder why you'd want to do that in the first place. And the, the basic idea is that it provides a way to put two different estimation procedures on equal footing. Right? If I have procedure one, procedure two, I don't know anything about how many parameters are spending, it's hard to compare them. Understanding degrees of freedom helps me kind of put them on, on equal footing. So here's an example. Um, I have two friends. I have this friend Harry, suppose, uh, and he likes this estimation procedure called SPAM, sparse additive models. I mean, the, the procedures aren't, aren't important at this point. Another friend, his name is Al, and he likes support vector regression, and they're very partial to these methods for some reason. Um, okay, so let's suppose that they decide that they want to look at some performance measure. This could be mean squared error, it could be anything, right? They just want to measure some performance measure with their two estimators, and each of these Procedures has a tuning parameter. For span, spam, I'm going to call it um, lambda, and for SVR, I'm going to call it gamma. Okay, so this is what these, their error curves look like over the respective tuning parameter values. But these tuning parameters, they're not on the same scale. They don't really even kind of balance the same quantities. So at this point, it's hard to tell. It's really impossible to compare these two error curves. I could just look at the minimum, but then I, I wouldn't understand kind of um, how the procedures relate in terms of their performance. Okay, but if I reparameterize in terms of degrees of freedom, if I have some way of describing degrees of freedom for spam and degrees of freedom for SVR, and I reparameterize so that I look at it as a function of degrees of freedom now, then I can actually compare these curves. And I can see that for this made up example, 
Well, it looks like spam probably, I'm sorry, SVR probably has a lower, say, mean squared error overall. But look, it's, it's achieving that with higher degrees of freedom. So it's fitting complex models better. Whereas um, spam, it has a little bit of higher degrees of freedom, but it can achieve, sorry, a little bit higher error rate, but it can achieve that for a smaller degrees of freedom. And so it's actually fitting the simpler models much better than um, support vector regression is. And then when it comes to trying to fit more complex models, it seems to be pretty far off. So now we can understand kind of the error rates in relation to model complexity and compare them across these two different um, estimators. So comparing performance of estimators is kind of one um, high level idea. Another high level idea would be comparing behavior of estimators. So this is a problem that I was interested in recently. Um, <clears throat> suppose I have some, uh, this is synthetic data that I, I made up. I actually took a piecewise cubic here that has a very high frequency part and a kind of a low frequency part over here. And I applied two different um, estimators to this data set, which was just drawn with normal noise around this curve, smoothing splines and trend filtering. So I'll, I'll describe what trend filtering is later. Smoothing splines, uh, maybe most of you know what that is already. It's, uh, it basically applies an L2 shrinkage, kind of in the form of like a generalized ridge regression um, over a natural spline basis or a spline basis with knots at each data point. So what it does is it aims to basically um, shrink that spline as you increase the tuning parameter to be more and more smooth. But because it's L2 shrinkage, my idea was that, well, um, it can't pick up both high frequency parts and low frequency parts. It can't capture both kind of like a globally smooth signal and a locally very wig wiggly signal at the same time. Trend filtering is a, is a similar um, basic idea, but it uses an L1 penalty instead of an L2 penalty to do the shrinkage. So it can actually set some of these uh, discrete fourth derivatives if it's a piecewise cubic to zero exactly, so it might be able to pick up a wiggly part and a smooth part at the same time. So to make the idea more precise, I tune them to the same degrees of freedom. I force them to use, for example, both 16 degrees of freedom. Right, now I can see that, well, the smoothing spline, you can see it, it grossly underfits this wiggly part. Because if it uses that few degrees of freedom, then it's actually forced by the nature of the L2 norm to shrink this this estimate here a lot. This fits pretty well, but this doesn't. The trend filtering estimate doesn't. Okay, now I can turn up the degrees of freedom of the smoothing spline, and I can see it actually requires a lot more degrees of freedom for it to pick up um, this kind of wiggly part here. And if you look carefully, it's also doing something It's not really favorable in the other part of the curve. It's kind of um, overfitting in the smooth region now. So degrees of freedom is useful here because it helps me, like I said, kind of compare the behavior of these estimators in concrete terms based on how many parameters they're fitting. So here's uh, the definition for degrees of freedom. And we think about estimation under squared error loss. So think about we have some continuous outcome y. And um, we want to estimate it. It's our observed data. And we don't assume anything about its distribution. We only assume, assume kind of these moment conditions that marginally each data point has um, variance sigma squared and they're uncorrelated. And I think about some estimation procedure G that takes this data vector Y and it gives me back a vector of fitted values Y hat. Right, so Y hat is, is equal to G of Y. So it's a fitting procedure. Then the degrees of freedom of this procedure G is defined as follows. Basically, we look at 1 over the marginal noise variance, sigma squared, and we sum over the data points. Um, we take the covariance of the ith data point with the ith fitted value. So it's the covariance of yi with, with gi of y. And I can also write that as the trace of the covariance matrix between y and g, those two vectors. So the, the basic intuition is that the more kind of adaptive g is, the higher this covariance is and the higher the degrees of freedom. The less adaptive, the smaller this covariance is and the smaller degrees of freedom. It measures the influence of yi on the ith fitted value. And we're going to see lots of examples of this shortly, um, but I want, to, I want to kind of discuss why I said <coughs> estimation under squared error loss first. And this is also going to provide some motivation for studying degrees of freedom in a little more concrete way than the <coughs> high level ideas I just gave you 
So let, let's just write down the mean of, of y is mu. So this is some unknown mean vector that we're actually trying to estimate. That's the goal. And let's suppose we observe an independent copy of y. So call it y prime. It comes from the same distribution. Then this is a, a very um, easy calculation, so I'm going to do it explicitly on the board, I mean on the slide. You might ask, how well can we predict y prime from g of y? So I saw y, I fit g, and now I get a new one, y prime. How well can I predict under squared error loss? And it's very closely to, tied to degrees of freedom. And to see that, um, we basically just take the expected value of y prime minus g of y squared. So that's the expected prediction error under squared error loss. We add them, so we're just going to add and subtract mu in here. And I get these two terms. Expected value of y prime minus mu squared plus the expected value of mu minus g of y squared. The cross term is zero though because those two are independent. Right, so I can take the expectation over each part and they both have mean, or for example this one, y prime has mean mu so that part's zero. And now I just, uh, in the second part, I'm going to add and subtract y. So the first part gives me n sigma squared, that's just the, the sum of the marginal variances. In the second part, I add and subtract y, I get the expected value of mu minus y squared plus um, y minus g of y squared plus 2 times this cross term. Okay, now, now, like I said, it's a very straightforward calculation. This is n sigma squared. This is also n sigma squared, right? It's just some of the marginal variances. And if you look at the first, the inner product of this with the first term here, y, that's actually minus 2 n sigma squared. So all of those n sigma squareds cancel out. And what I'm left with is this, the expected value of y minus g of y squared, and 2 times the inner product between y and, sorry, mu minus y and minus g of y, which is actually just exactly what we had before. It's the trace of the covariance between y and g of y. So what we learned just from this very simple decomposition is that the expected prediction error is equal to the expected training error plus 2 times sigma squared times the degrees of freedom. Okay, so if I know degrees of freedom exactly, and I know what the training error is, oops, I don't want to pull my mic off, then I, I know what the expected prediction error is. Okay, and that's true. There's no assumptions here on y other than moment conditions, and we just are looking at squared error loss. So let's suppose we actually have an unbiased estimate of degrees of freedom now. So I actually have some df hat, which when I take its expectation gives me degrees of freedom then I can plug that into the observed training error at y. Right, I do the observed training error plus 2 times sigma squared times the estimated degrees of freedom. That gives me an unbiased estimate of prediction error. So that, that's, this is the basic motivation at a kind of more mathematical level for studying degrees of freedom. And um, so when g is a linear regression estimate, this is just the CP statistic. You will have seen this as the training error plus 2 times sigma squared times the number of predictors. And uh, this, this idea is also referred to as SURE, which stands for Stein, Stein's Unbiased risk, esti risk Estimate, when this DF hat is computed in a particular clever way, and we'll get to that probably at the end. Um, so if we want to choose between G1 and G2, based on, um, if we're interested in prediction error, then we could just kind of uh, take estimates of the degrees of freedom, and then we would get estimates of their expected prediction error, and that would help us choose between two fitting procedures. And in principle, if, if suppose G had a tuning parameter, theta, we could choose theta to minimize this estimate of prediction error. But it, it's worth saying that it's, it's not understood precisely how this model selection criterion behaves um, under minimization. Like if we're minimizing over theta, it's not clear what the resulting model looks like, especially in the high dimensional setting. So people have studied this for, for kind of the number of features fixed and, and n growing to infinity, and then there's lots of results on related procedures like, like I said, like CP. There's also a BIC criterion which replaces this 2 by a log n. People understand kind of what happens in the fixed P n going to, infin n going to infinity setting, but in, in terms of the high dimensional setting, we don't really know what happens when we use these types of model selection criterion. So that's one open problem to do with degrees of freedom in model selection. <coughs> so let's go through some examples of common procedures. There'll be a lot more quizzes. I expect you guys will do better since you're statisticians and machine learners rather than physicists and, and um, chemists. But um, here's the definition of degrees of freedom again. Remember we just uh, 
take the covariance between each data point and its fitted value, we add them up, we divide by sigma squared. And as I said before, you can usually guess degrees of freedom based on your intuition. So let's start off with a, a pretty easy one. Um, let's suppose we have just the average estimator. So we, we get y, we just estimate um, each component by the mean of the sample, y bar. So what do you think the degrees of freedom is here intuitively? How many parameters are we fitting? One, yeah, that's exactly right. So there's, there's just one parameter being fit, it's really just y bar, so we can check that pretty easily. The covariance between yi and y bar is just sigma squared over n, so we add that up, we just get um, one, because the sigma squares cancel. Okay, how about the identity estimator? So we, this is a very naive estimator, we just give back y. We observe y, we give it right back. What do you think the degrees of freedom is there? n, exactly, yeah. And again, it's an easy check. We just get sigma squared for each of the covariance between yi and its fitted value, and the sigma squares cancel. So um, maybe it's helpful to note here that degrees of freedom can be arbitrarily large. I can just take some constant multiple of y and take c to infinity. So I can get arbitrarily complex procedures. It can also be negative, which is kind of strange. You can think, how can a procedure use a negative number of parameters? That doesn't seem possible, but According to this definition, we just can take minus y, right? And, and the degrees of freedom would be then just minus n, for example. Okay, so this is a, another common procedure. It's a little more substantive, though. Linear regression. So suppose we have now a matrix of covariates, and all of these um, examples and everything coming up, we're going to think of this matrix as fixed. So y is what's random, but x is fixed. So x is some n by p matrix. Its columns are the predictors, and we're going to assume those predictors are linearly independent. And we, we estimate g to be x times beta hat, where beta hat comes from solving just this least squares problem, linear regression. So what do you think about the degrees of freedom of g here? P, right, because informally, I'm just writing g as a linear function of, of p predictors, so, whoops, don't know how I did that. I'm writing g as a linear function of p predictors, uh, x1 through xp, and I'm just spending one degree of freedom for each coefficient I fit in that linear combination. So you want to be a little more formal, we would just take this usual definition, now it helps to use the, the matrix formula, so I'm taking the covariance between um, y and x beta hat, and uh, remember beta hat is equal to x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So basically the covariance of y with itself gives me sigma squared, all the x's pull out to get this matrix here, this is the projection on the column space of x. And then I can, I can actually um, do kind of permutations if they're uh, circular, or I can actually move an x over inside the trace, because I can commute under the trace, and then I get basically uh, the p by p identity matrix, so the degrees of freedom is just p. Okay, a little more um, adaptive, a little more complicated is the regression spline. So the idea here is that we have m fixed knots, so we put those down ahead of time, and um, we fit a piecewise cubic function that's continuous over the whole space, it's also continuous in its first and second derivatives. <coughs> So basically we have to make sure that each knot the cubic function matches and has matching first and second derivatives. That's called a cubic reg regression spline. So what do you think about degrees of freedom for this particular estimator? This one's a little bit more, more challenging. but so the answer is m plus 4. So n is the number of knots, it's actually m plus 4. And informally there's a very easy way to see that. Um, I think I've tangled myself in my own cord here. So if, you, uh, if we estimate within each region, right, so we think about the regions are fixed. So within each region, I'm estimating a cubic function. So that's four parameters. Right, it's 1 for the intercept and 3 for the, the multipliers on x, x squared, and x cubed, for example. So I have 4, 4, 4, 
and I have m plus 1 regions, so I have m naught, so it's 4 times m plus 1 parameters for that step. Now there's another step which tells me, oh, you have to be continuous at each naught, and you have to have continuous first and second derivatives. So those are kind of like three constraints we put at each naught. Continuous, continuous first derivative, continuous second derivative. So I have three m parameters that I have to subtract. So the answer is 4 times m plus 1 minus 3m, which is m plus 4. That's kind of the, the informal justification for degrees of freedom. Like I said, that's something you might reason if you didn't know the definition. And it turns out to be right in this case if you check it. So all these um, examples that we learned so far, they're all example, examples of what's called linear smoothers. So suppose we have uh, g equals s of y, where s is some matrix. That kind of captures all of the examples we discussed. It also covers ridge regression and smoothing splines. So what do you think about the degrees of freedom of g in this case? Might help if you had a piece of paper. I think it might be hard to see, but it's just the trace of that matrix S. Right, so that the check is pretty simple. We just get um, the covariance of y with S of y. The y's give us a sigma squared times identity matrix. They cancel, and what comes out is the trace of S. So if you understand the trace of the smoother matrix, you can describe degrees of freedom in all those examples that we went over. So what happens when G is not linear? And this is where it gets more interesting. So what's the, at least what I think is one of the first examples of a nonlinear estimator that's pretty common is the lasso. So now we have a predictor matrix X. It's N by P, just like we had before. So we have columns, and the, the columns are the predictors. And um, the lasso estimate tries to model Y as a linear combination of X, but using only a few of the predictor variables, a few of the columns. So we, it, it's equal to x times beta hat, where beta hat solves the following problem. The first term is just like least squares, then we add lambda times the L1 norm of beta. So lambda is a tuning parameter. We can make it bigger or smaller. If it's bigger, then there's less um, non-zero coefficients in beta, or in beta hat. And by the L1 norm, I just mean the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. So what's nice about the lasso is that it, ad it adaptively chooses an active set A, which is the support of beta hat of variables. So that at the end, I can write g of y as a linear combination of the columns in A. Because every other coefficient outside of A is 0. And that A is chosen uh, in conjunction with the estimation step. Okay, and like I said before, a, a larger lambda means a smaller active set A. So this is one that I think is actually a bit surprising. How many degrees of freedom does g have? Anybody have a want to venture a guess? Of beta hat? Of the of the fit? That's actually that's right. It's the expected size of the active set. So in other words, it's just the number of it's the expected number of chosen variables. And uh, I think this is actually an amazing result because A is adaptive here, right? We actually chose A. So if A was fixed, if I gave you A ahead of time and you did linear regression, then the degrees of freedom would just be this. It's just the size of A. That's the number of predictors. But somehow the lasso is both choosing A and it's estimating the variables in A. It's giving them coefficients. And in total, it's only using degrees of freedom equal to the expected size of A. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit, I think that's actually a pretty surprising result. And we'll also, we'll, we'll see how to prove this shortly. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to that. Hopefully I will. Okay, so the, the classic method for variable selection in the linear model is best subset selection. People were thinking about that well before they thought about lasso or, or related problems. So we can kind of summarize that as follows. G is equal to x beta hat, where I just replace this L1 norm with an L0 norm. <coughs> That counts the number of non-zero variables. Okay, you usually see this written in constrained form, like I want to minimize least squares error subject to L0 norm being smaller than or equal to K or something, but I can also write in Lagrangian form. It's still best subset selection. So what's the degrees of freedom of G here? That's another question. Well, I'll save you the trouble of guessing. I don't know the answer. Um, this is something that uh, I think is a, is an interesting kind of basic problem. How many parameters are we spending with best subset selection? 
As far as I can tell, there's not a good answer for that. It seems like intuitively it has to be bigger than the expected size of its active set. Right? If best, if best subset selection for a particular lambda gives us back 20 variables, it seems like that the degrees of freedom would have to be larger than 20. And I'll explain why I think that when, I, when we kind of go over the, the lasso result. Um, and there's, uh, there's some current work on this topic at the end that I'll, I'll get to, hopefully. So I'm going to go through some of these examples rather quickly now. Um, they're really very similar to the lasso result. And I, just for the sake of time, I wanted to get to a basic idea of how you prove that lasso result. Um, but there's a bunch of different structured problems you can look at that involve the, the L1 norm. And they have similar degrees of freedom results too. So let's suppose that Y correspond to successive positions on a line. Okay, so we, we think about y like ordered on a line, and this one diffuse lasso estimate, it, uh, it gives us a piecewise constant fit along that line by penalizing the successive differences along that line. Okay, so if, if this were our data, these black points, this problem gives us the blue curve for a particular value of lambda, and it adaptively chooses these breakpoints or jumps. It chooses those based on the data. We don't fix those ahead of time, that's just part of the, esti that's part of the procedure. It estimates the breakpoints and then the coefficients. So what's the degrees of freedom of G? The answer is actually the, num the expected number of levels. So if I have four levels here, or five levels here, the degrees of freedom and expectation is just five. Or rather, sorry, the ex that's an unbiased estimate for degrees of freedom, five. And I'm going to stop saying this, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable also, right? Because we chose the breakpoints adaptively. And somehow we chose them and we still fit the levels, even though there are only five levels and degrees of freedom is five at the end. Question? What is the expectation over the of points? Exactly. So the expectation is over, it's a good question. Um, the expectation is basically over y. Right? So all we assumed was that y came from this distribution. So I'm just taking expectation over y. X is fixed. That's it. Yeah, it's still true because it's true for any fixed x. Well, okay, so if I have a random x, then for any fixed x, the expectation over y gives me uh, the expected size of the active set degrees of freedom. So if I take an expectation over x, it would still be true. It just depends on if you're considering y and x independent, I guess. Okay, so the next problem uh, that I wanted to look at is the 2-diffuse lasso. So it's similar to the 1-diffuse lasso, except for now we penalize the differences between horizontally and vertically adjacent pixels in an image. So it gives us a piecewise constant image, or a piecewise constant signal over the 2D plane. So basically I can write that as, I think about Y as corresponding positions over 2D grid. I'm going to penalize the components of Y that correspond to adjacent horizontally or, vert or vertical positions. So I'm writing that as I tilde J. <coughs> so here's an example of this um, estimate at work, I give it this noisy picture of what looks like maybe a Carnegie Mellon C, and then I apply this um, estimation procedure and it gives me back beta hat, and for a particular value of lambda it looks like that. You can see so it shows, it shows kind of piecewise constant color patches in the image. So what's its degrees of freedom? The answer is similar, it's just the number of patches. Surprising because those patches were chosen adaptively. And the fuse lasso can also be thought of on a graph too. It doesn't only have to be a chain or this 2D grid. It can also be just an arbitrary graph. So I have some given graph and I basically penalize the differences between edges and, or nodes that are joined by an edge in that graph. So I can write that as all ij that are joined by some edge and the underlying edge set of the opposite value of beta i minus beta j. That's the penalty. So in the most general form, it adaptively chooses connected components over the graph. And here I just drew them in different colors to show what they look like. Right, so based on lambda, it chooses a bunch of connected components for us. This might be useful if, if the graph structure you're interested in is not just a grid or a chain. And the same idea holds how many degrees of freedoms it have. It's just the expected number of connected components. Right, but this, this task seems pretty complicated of actually choosing connected components in the graph. But somehow it gets away with doing that and estimating values for each connected component. And it only spends, in total, an effective number of parameters equal to the expected number of connected components. So um, I'm going to kind of go through these very quickly. 
There's some other problems you can look at, like linear trend filtering. You basically penalize the discrete um, second differences instead of the discrete first differences, as you do with the one diffuse lasso. It gives you a piecewise linear trend where the kink points are chosen adaptively. The degrees of freedom is kind of in similar in flavor. And polynomial trend filtering, this is like I told you with the cubic trend filtering where I compute it to, compared to smoothing splines. Basically, you penalize the discrete k plus, k plus first order derivative between the betas, so the discrete fourth order derivative if you want to fit a, a cubic spline, where the knots are chosen adaptively. So it chooses the changes in third or in, in, uh, in fourth derivative adaptively for a cubic regression spline. Okay. And uh, how many degrees of freedom does it have? Well, the answer is the same as if we had the knots fixed ahead of time. So for, uh, for a cubic regression spline, where the knots are fixed ahead of time, the degrees of freedom is the number of knots plus four. So if it's a cubic, k is three. But here, if we fit a cubic trend filtering, the knots are adaptive, but somehow the degrees of freedom seems to be the same as if we fixed the knots ahead of time. So it's this strange phenomenon we've been encountering with all these L1 problems. So you might ask, well, how, why am I getting adaptive estimation for free? How am I doing this? This seems like it's something like I'm cheating somehow. So we just said this in the last slide, but cubic trend filtering uses the expected number of knots plus four degrees of freedom, but cubic regression spline uses basically the same number of degrees of freedom. There's no expectation because the knots are fixed, but they're fixed ahead of time. And um, the high level explanation for why this is true and how this can be is just um, due to the shrinkage in the L1 norm. So this maybe isn't too surprising. You know, if you look at, for example, this picture here, let's go back to the one diffuse lasso, you can see that the levels I estimate for each group of points are kind of shrunken towards zero, or towards each other. They're not just the mean of the points in each region. And that, that happens because I'm using an L1 norm to penalize the least squares criterion here. So with the lasso, it's also well known that the coefficients are shrunken towards zero of the non-zero variables. They're not kind of as aggressively fit as they are in linear regression. So that's not too surprising. That's not a phenomenon that, that you know, would have surprised you. But what is surprising is that um, it kind of exactly counterbalances. So we spend some on searching, and then we save some on shrinking, and they kind of exactly cancel out to give us degrees of freedom as if we had done <coughs> Um, no adaptivity at all, and we consider the adaptive model fixed ahead of time. So is that the reason why you would expect the L0 norm to have a lot more? Yeah, that's a, a great point. So this is the reason why I expect the L0 norm to have a lot more degrees of freedom than just the number of variables it selects, because it doesn't do any shrinking, right? There's no, that penalty is kind of invariant to a scaling of non-zero variables, so once it selects the variables, it fits them as aggressively as possible, and therefore, I think that it has to, has to be paying somehow for the searching step. So it has to be at least as large as the number of non-zero variables. Um, do I go until one? Yeah, OK. So I might go through the, the proof very quickly. Um, I didn't get very many references. Here are some references for those results. Uh, and I'm going to give a kind of a, a high-level proof sketch for the last of degrees of freedom. For this, we need Stein's formula for degrees of freedom, which I'm going to go over next. So Stein's formula basically is an alternate way of computing degrees of freedom. And it tells us that now if y is actually normal, so if we actually assume that it's normal with mean mu and variant sigma squared, that should be a sigma squared i, because it's a vector. So this is more than just the moment conditions we assumed at the start. And if G satisfies two properties, these regularity conditions, one is continuity, the other is almost differentiability. It's kind of a tongue twister, but it's, it's different than almost, than differentiable almost everywhere. It's not the same thing, but it's, it's related. Um, Stein's formula states that this covariance that we use to compute degrees of freedom can be written differently, just as the expected value of the sum of the partial derivatives of the i-th fitting function with respect to the i-th data point. So, this is called the divergence of G, what's in the right-hand side, inside the expectation. This actually turns out to be a lot easier to compute for a lot of procedures, the right-hand side. Even, even though it looks more complicated, it's a lot more amenable to computation um, explicitly for a lot of these procedures. 
And this result comes from this famous lemma of Stein's, which says that if I have a normal random variable, standard normal random variable, and any differentiable function f, then the expected value of z times f of z is equal to the expected value of f prime of z. And this is actually used in a lot of other areas of statistics, not just degrees of freedom. The converse is actually also true. So if this holds for any differentiable function f, then z must be normal. So this is used all over in statistics. I'm just looking at basically the one direction and, and how it's helpful for computing degrees of freedom. So here's a proof sketch for the lasso. Basically the first step is to notice that we can write the lasso solution explicitly in terms of the active set and the signs of the active variables. And that just comes from um, once I know the active set and the active variables, I just can plug those back into the criterion. The L1 penalty becomes basically just an inner product of the signs times the, the variables and then inside the least squares term there's no beta that's not supported on the active set because those coefficients are all zero. So I can write the solution explicitly in terms of the active set and the active signs. And here xA means the columns of x that are indexed by A. And therefore I can also write the fit explicitly in terms of the active set and the active signs. So I just multiply by x or rather by xA because like I said beta hat zero outside of A and you get two terms. And this is, I think this is kind of a, a, a nice insight that the first term looks like linear regression on xA. So this is what we do is, is if we knew A ahead of time. Right? This is just the projection of, of Y into the column space of XA. The second term is actually what makes the lasso different from that. It's the shrinkage term. And it's this term that allows us to kind of save degrees of freedom and, and allows everything to work out just right. Okay, so this is basically involves lambda and the signs and then kind of a sphering by the XA, XA transpose XA. So here, again, a very kind of quick proof sketch. So we notice that if we look at this fit, this is our fitting function, right? If we could treat A and S as locally constant, if they didn't have a derivative of Y, then we could just um, take the derivative of this with respect to Y, or of the ith component with respect to YI, add them up. It's called the divergence, like we do in Stein's formula. And then we get basically the trace of this leading matrix. If we think of, of A and S as constants, and that's just the size of A. And if that was true for every y, or for almost every y, except for y in a set of measure zero, then taking an expectation gives us the degrees of freedom formula. So now all we have to do is we have to believe that the active set and the active signs that the lasso chooses are locally constant with respect to y. If I move y just a little bit, then I'm going to get the same active set and the, and the same active signs <coughs> out of the solution. And if I believe that, then from what we just showed, then we could show that the degrees of freedom was was the expected size of the number of variables selected. So why would you believe that? Here's a proof by picture. Um, so again, it, I'm not trying to convey too much details, but you can think of the lasso as project, projecting y onto a convex polyhedron. That's one way you can think of the lasso. And each face of this polyhedron describes a particular active set and a particular, active, uh, particular vector of active signs. So, there's a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between the active set that you get out of the lasso and the signs and the face of that polyhedron. So what, what you can look at is that if I look at that point y up there and I wiggle it a bit, it's going to project to the same face. So I'm going to get the same active set and the act same active signs if I move y a little bit. It's exactly what I want to know, that, that the active set and the active signs are locally constant with small perturbations of y. That's not true if, if I put y in one of these rays here. Right, because if, if Y is on one of these rays and I move it a bit, then it's going to project to a different face depending on which side, it, which side of this ray that I'm on, that I move it. But the set of these rays has, has measure zero, right? They're like uh, a collection of, of affine spaces that are of dimension, say, less than n minus 1 or less than equal n minus 1 in Rn. So if I take a union over all of them, it's measure zero. So almost everywhere, for almost every Y, I can move um, y a bit and it projects to the same face of the polyhedron. I get the same active set, the same active signs, so they have no derivative with y almost everywhere. So very briefly now I wanted to kind of go over uh, an extension of this to discontinuous fitting procedures. So we skipped over the part where we checked that G satisfies those regularity conditions, continuity and almost differentiability that we needed to apply Stein's theorem, but I think that comes from the picture also. It comes from the ge geometric viewpoint.
The problem with this framework is that many common procedures are discontinuous in Y, meaning that we can't apply Stein's formula. And two important examples are the relaxed lasso, <coughs> and for this, uh, this procedure we just take A that the lasso gave us, the active set, and then we do regression on it. So we don't do any shrinkage. And people like this because if you think of the shrinkage as kind of being a bias in the estimate, then this removes the bias. We let lasso do the searching and then we just do least squares on the selected variables. That's not continuous in Y. And you can also see that from the geometric picture, but the, you can think of basically as a high level, shrinking is what, it, what makes the lasso continuous. If I move Y a bit and the active set changes, then because I shrunk, I, it's actually still going to be continuous. But now that I'm not shrinking, if I move Y a bit and the active set changes, then basically I can get a very different fit out of it. And best subset selection is also another example of a procedure that's very discontinuous. Right? This is a very, it's non-convex, it's highly non-convex. Uh, it's about as far from convex as you can get, and you can move Y around and, and you can get very different answers out of the fit. Yeah. So do you know what I mean uh, for the last lesson, what, what would you give the freedom? That's what I'm going to get to. Yeah. So um, basically both procedures eliminate bias. They try to eliminate bias due to shrinking. That's why you'd use them. And intuitively, they should both have degrees of freedom larger than the number of expected selected variables. But ha knowing how much larger would be important. Are you using twice the number of parameters if you're estimating the active set um, and then doing least squares via lasso? We don't know. So you can basically modify Stein's formula to accommodate what I'm calling, I guess, well-behaved discontinuous functions. And uh, here's the kind of the, the most, the simplest case to report. If x is orthogonal, then you can use this modification of Stein's formula to show that the relaxed lasso has this degree of freedom. It's the expected size of the active set plus something else. And this other term is defined in terms of mu, sigma, lambda, and x and the normal density, phi. I'm calling this term search degrees of freedom. That's what I, I'm going to refer to it from here on. And the reason I'm doing that is because you can think of this first term as this, the cost of the linear regression step once you've found the active set. So if you've discovered A, then just fitting those variables via linear regression costs expected size of A. So what's left over? The leftover degrees of freedom that's kind of how much we spent on searching, how much we spent to find A in the first place. Um, unfortunately, this depends on the true mean, mu, in a non-obvious way, and I can't see a way to get an unbiased estimate out of it. Right, so for the lasso, we had these results that it was just the expected size of the active set, or for the fused lasso, it was the expected number of connected components, etc. It's hard to know how to get an unbiased estimate of a quantity like that, because it depends on the true mean. So here's just a picture of what that looks like, um, parameterized by the expected number of active variables. So for the relaxed lasso, if I'm fitting, say, um, 40 variables, then the total degrees of freedom is being shown in blue. You can see it's, it's almost 80. So if I'm, spinning, if I'm fitting 40 of 100 total variables, and then I'm doing least squares on the variables that I chose of those 40, the total degrees of freedom is, is really inflated. So this is, it's kind of uh, indicative of how much shrinking really helps us save in terms of degrees of freedom. The second term that I had shown you, this term here, the search degrees of freedom, I drew that in red. So this is telling you how much it costs to search if the number of variables you find is, say, 60, 80, etc. And the thing that I thought was kind of interesting is that the search curve peaks at about 30 variables. So if if you look at 50 variables, then suppose I want to choose 50 out of 100 variables. Um, there are more subsets of size 50 out of a total of 100 variables than there are of any other size. That's just because 100 times 50, 100 choose 50 is largest. So I would expect that it costs mo the most to search kind of at 50. But according to the formula in this picture, it actually costs more to search for smaller subsets of variables, which I don't really understand why. That's another kind of um, question that I have that I haven't answered. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up. Um, basically, for a general X, uh, there, you can still get an, an expression for degrees of freedom of the relaxed lasso.
it's defined in terms of the discontinuities that the relaxed lasso fit. So again, there's kind of a geometric picture there to describe that. But there isn't a simple form for that like I gave you for the orthogonal case. So the challenge is, is in understanding what that means. And for best subset selection, um, things are kind of much, there's, I've had much, much less progress with it. And I realize now this looks kind of funny that I wrote it on the slide, but it's, it's a badly behaved discontinuous function. And what I mean by that is that its discontinuities don't lie on some nice set of rays or something. It's, it's much more ugly than that. And the, this extension of Stein's formula that I mentioned, it doesn't apply. You can't apply it to best subset selection. There's all, all sorts of other problems in terms of uniqueness, too, with the best subset selection fit. So I don't really know what the answer is there yet. Um, so there's lots of unanswered questions to do with degrees of freedom. I think it's, I personally think it's a pretty interesting topic and maybe some of you guys would be interested in it too. Um, I just only talked about squared air loss is another, another thing I want to mention. So there's, uh, there should be a notion of degrees of freedom maybe in, in other problems like where the, the loss isn't just squared air, maybe it comes from some likelihood or log likelihood like inverse covariance estimation. You might ask how much is, are you spending in estimating a covariance matrix? I don't think that there's really a lot of work that's been done to explore that. <coughs> and in classification too, right? There's natural losses for classification. How many parameters is some classifier fitting? And then this is probably the one that's the most out there or the, I think the, the least explored is what about unsupervised learning? I do some un unsupervised technique on a data set. I'm surely, um, spending some amount of parameters, but it, there's not a really precise definition for what that means. Intuitively, this concept of, of effective number of parameters extends to all these settings, but there's not really a precise way of describing that yet. So, okay, that was it. I want to um, acknowledge this is my PhD advisor, Jonathan Taylor, and a lot of this work was, a lot of the, the work in the first half of the talk was joint with him, so this is his work too. Okay, thank you. strongly. That's what I, maybe I didn't do a good enough job explaining that or conveying that. So there's, what you're talking about is exactly what I wrote down, modulo maybe some different multipliers. So for example, if, if I change the 2 to a log n, then this is just BIC. And that's a, mo a common model selection criterion. And a lot of times people don't use the right degrees of freedom because they don't know what the degrees of freedom is, or they just kind of say, I'm going to choose the degrees of freedom to be this, or blah. So it's, it's, it's not really, I think it's somewhat more ad hoc, but uh, what I was maybe saying at the bottom here is that I don't really know of much literature that, that, has, that kind of explains the precise connection between doing something like this, choosing a turning parameter by doing something like that, minimizing the uh, estimated expected prediction error, and the model that comes out, especially in high dimensions. And for p fixed, for, for an n going to infinity, there's literature that says that um, doing this exactly gives you two large models. If you replace the two with a log n, you get kind of the right model. That's like, at a high level, the um, preference for BIC over AIC. So AIC is good for prediction error, but for model selection, it, it chooses models that are too large. If you put a log n in, in place of the two, you put a kind of a higher penalty on model complexity in terms of the low dimensional setting, that gives you c consistency. But I don't know the answer in, for, for the high dimensional setting. What about the generalized linear models? Like, so I guess that goes into the likelihood. Yeah. So what, um, what's the picture of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So there, there's, um, for classical procedures with no penalties, you can uh, define degrees of freedom as a difference between basically the likelihood at the, at the mo full model minus the likelihood at like a trivial model, like usually the mean or something. And that definition of degrees of freedom usually matches the covariance definition exactly. I think it's true for all exponential families. But once you start penalizing, if you, if you want to look at the difference between the penalized likelihood and the trivial likelihood, 
it's no longer the same as the covariance form. So there's a disconnect between definitions of degrees of freedom. That's why I kind of stuck with the covariance form because the covariance form is very, you can explicitly compute it for a bunch of problems. Um, and the, the likelihood difference definition, you can't always explicitly compute. So I don't really know how to connect all the, all the dots together for, for GLMs. So if you, if you have a model that, uh, that doesn't take the shrinkage into account, uh, and your, the number of parameters you're fitting exceeds the number of variables you have, what sort of inference could you make about those extra variables? The right. extra amount of degrees of freedom? Yeah, so if, you're, if your degrees of freedom exceeds your, the total number of variables you have in your data. I see. Right, so you, you had the graph before with 100 different variables, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if it ever did in that case, honestly. Oh, well, could, could that happen? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. So here you can see the total degrees of freedom is always less than 100, and it's equal to 100 when you fit all 100 variables. I don't know if it ever could exceed the number of variables completely. I mean, I guess if the method, well, actually we had, we had examples where if you take c times y, right, you can make it arbitrarily large. Yeah. So that's an example of a, of a kind of trivial procedure where the degrees of freedom can blow up, and you could have just one parameter, but I could be one predictor in the model, but I could just return c times y and let C get really large. I'm not sure. Um, so the only connections I know from degrees of freedom to inference are, are, are through that equation I showed you. The prediction error is decomposed into training error and two times degrees of freedom, or sigma times degrees of freedom. And uh, I suppose you just would see that from that that the prediction error would get horribly large. But um, connecting degrees of freedom to inference I, I feel like is still a there's still some gap there, especially when the, there's adaptivity involved. But I, I think it's for an important question. And in practice, if we were using the degrees of freedom as a penalty for, say, the last set, you would just plug in the observed spark, size of the sparse you said? Yeah, right. Yeah, so the idea would be for the relaxed last so if you had, if there was some way to estimate this quantity in a way that, that didn't depend on mu, obviously, you could plug in that for the degrees of freedom and it would give you a better idea of its expected prediction error because it has a higher model complexity. Or for the lasso, you'd plug in just the, the size of A. Yeah. So if I use a one loss for the lasso, so does that mean uh, currently there is no good definition for degree of freedom? <coughs> the L1 loss function. Oh, so that, yeah, that's a good question. So if you change the loss from squared error to L1, there actually is a recent work by, I don't remember the authors, it's called Generalized Degrees of Freedom. It covers the L1 case. Um, so if you want to do like a robust lasso. But I, I'm not sure, I don't know the literature on that paper that well. I don't, I don't know how good the connections are, but there is at least some work on that. Yeah. At the beginning, you said that degrees of freedom is used two different ways in statistics, and you're going to focus on one of them. Yeah. Out of curiosity. Oh, the, the second one is it usually, it's kind of more of a, um, it's not used in, it's in, 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 in an easy way. Like, for example, you might say that uh, when you're doing something like ANOVA, how many degrees of freedom are there in the residual or something like that. So it's, it's a similar usage. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you estimate, uh, a mean parameter and then you want to know what the degrees of freedom of the residual is, it's, it'd be n minus 1 if there's n um, observations. So it's a similar usage, but then there's also the usage um, for like uh, distributions, like a t distribution with so many degrees of freedom or a chi-square distribution with so many degrees of freedom. So there's a couple different more classical usages of degrees of freedom that I didn't want to confuse people by. That was it. But. Yeah. So what happens in case of like non-parametric methods? Oh, something like a smoothing spline? I mean, sort of like a nearest neighbor regression or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so I remember reading somewhere that, that um, there was some work on the degrees of freedom of like a regression tree. And the, it was shown that these are all kind of like more um, heuristic or empirical studies. It's, it's a lot harder to, to analyze degrees of freedom for non-parametric methods because it's just hard to analyze those methods 
in general. But for, for regression trees, the, the stump, I remember reading somewhere, has about three degrees of freedom. So just the first split, you spend three degrees of freedom. And then as you make splits further down the tree, the degrees of freedom kind of decays. So it, it becomes less and less and less. And for, um, for other methods, I didn't really mention this, but you could always just do like a bootstrap sample of y. And then you could try to estimate degrees of freedom empirically. You just would refit the procedure on bootstrap samples of y, and then you would estimate that covariance empirically, and that would give you an estimate for degrees of freedom. And it, it would be, depending on the structure, it might be pretty good. So for non-parametric method, you could do that. Just kind of keep fitting on, on um, sampled, resampled data sets. Okay.